Hello and welcome once again to Crazy Comics and Stories. It's me, your charming and delightful old Uncle Rat Bastard. Dr. Uncle Rat Bastard. And at the other end... Holy crap! Stop the podcast! Stop the podcast! We got breaking news here! Serious, world-consequencing, crushing news! Uh, You do know that this won't be released for another week, right? By then it might be over! Too late! People... Dan Slott says retailers haven't ordered enough copies of Clone Conspiracy. I'm shocked. Shocked, I tell you. Well, that, that it doesn't surprise me you'd say that, looking at the sales figures that came out today. Yeah, yeah. No, Dan Dan says it's, it's basically his own fault because uh, they they although they've been saying the, the Clone Conspiracy will be the core Spider-Man title, he's, it's not a miniseries. It is the Spider-Man event. You know, he's he's trying to get it like Clone Conspiracy. Think Spider Island, Ends of the Earth, Spider Verse. He's talking that big, having ramification in Amazing Spider-Man, Prowler, and Silk. Um, but he says he just realizes there's probably been just too much. But you know, hey, Slot hasn't really done bad on Amazing Spider-Man. So, despite the fact that we get you know, a little bit of spittle in our throat whenever we talk about the uh, clone saga. Maybe Slot can pull off the clone conspiracy. I mean, the couple Amazing Spider-Mans leading up to it have actually been kind of interesting. Yeah, I, well, first off, I'm okay with anything that Dan Slot does on Spider-Man. He, he has yet to let me down on any of his stories. And with this one, the fact that he's saying, no, 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 this is the main Spider-Man book. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> the Klimt. No, um, Amazing Spider-Man is the main Spider-Man book. This is, yes, it's a miniseries. Yes, it's a big deal. And yes, it's going to cross over and blah, 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 blah. But to try and say, no, this is the main Spider-Man book, well, uh, okay. Okay. Was it under-ordered? Probably, because I saw what the orders were for Champions Number 1. Did you hear how many people, how many orders there were well, for before, Champions Number 1? Before we get to that, you should probably introduce me. Uh, it, it, you broke in. Yeah, but, you know, first-time listeners probably have no idea. Who is this guy interrupting the alleged Dr. Rat Bastard? Dr. Uncle Rat Bastard. Oh, I don't know. Astonishingly excellent MD. At the other end of the series of tubes and wires we call the interwebs is Joe, crazy writer. How you doing today, Joe? Oh, I got a little bit more of that spittle up in my mouth after that intro. Oh. <laughs> oh. Speaking of sales figures, I thought, you know, you were talking about, uh, before the awesome introduction you gave me, I was reading something on Bleeding Cool where they talk about how they think that, D- did DC gain the numbers over the last couple months? Because everything they had was returnable. So retailers ordered tons of it, probably much more than they would normally order, knowing that they wouldn't be stuck on the vine for it. And judging by the way Rebirth went, it sounds like that's a good thing they did. But they're just wondering, you know, is this something that's going to hold? Did DC game the numbers to get all these lovable slots pulled away from Marvel? Is that why Dan Slott is so worried and pulling out his hair? Wait, is Dan Slott old? Because I was looking at the numbers, and then I looked at the DC-52 numbers, and they're fairly comparable, but there were other things DC did this time they didn't do last time. Oh, God, I hope Dan doesn't pull his hair out. He doesn't have much left. (laughs) Last time, DC tried a whole bunch of new stuff. You know, they, they had a, a Western comic. They had a horror comics. They had I, Vampire. Who the hell remembers I, Vampire, other than J.M.D. Matias, because he wrote it? That was a TV show, too, I think. No. No, that was I, Vampire. I Zombie. I'm sorry. Right. How many eyes in I, the world? I, Vampire was the uh, series in the final issues of House of Mystery, when they said, well, nobody's buying it because it's an anthology, so let's have a continued story in it. Yeah, it didn't help. <laughs> This time, look at what they're publishing. It's all Batman, Superman, Harley Quinn, 
Justice League. It's all the big names. You don't have any second stringers other than maybe, you could probably say Raven is a second stringer, um, Deathstroke is a second stringer, but it's not like they're trying a bunch of different genres. It's all DC Universe. It's all main characters. So what is their best-selling book? The best-selling book for this month is Harley Quinn number one. Well, no, no worries there. What did, what did it sell? Around 350,000 copies. That's pretty solid. Yes, that's uh, pretty solid. I wonder though if that includes... See, here's where it gets interesting, because there were probably about equal as many variant covers for that yes. baby. So it's always hard to figure. And they don't break them down this way, but I'd love to know what how many regular comics versus all the other ones. And because I know when you look on eBay under Harley Quinn 1, you get a crap load of variants. Yeah. And that's the other thing that both Marvel and DC are doing. They're, they're jump, cramming out the variants because even though it's weird to me that I don't care about variants at all, but they still seem to be selling. Matter of fact, Valiant got a whole bunch of press because they aren't just doing variant covers. They aren't just doing cosplay covers like Marvel did. No, they're doing cat cosplay covers, where cats are dressed up as their characters. And, um, and DC and Marvel are going, don't! Why didn't we think of that? We thought a gorilla month, and Frank chose eight months. We totally blanked on cats. I don't think it's going to help Valiant, though. <laughs> Here's the other thing that a lot of the creators at Marvel are saying, because they're being, you know, fans are going, oh, your book dropped from number 25 to number 50. And the creators are saying, yeah, but it sold the same number of issues. You know, it sold the same number. And here's the other thing that I pointed out earlier today on Twitter and, and at the Facebook and other places. Tom Vrevoort gets asked all the time about the sales figures that are published, and a lot of people say, you know, they're not accurate. And one of the things he said was that, okay, that doesn't count digital sales. It doesn't count sales on newsstands. It doesn't count international sales. It doesn't count, um, you know, subscriptions. It doesn't count this. It doesn't count this. One of the things that I found out from following Amy Reader, if you look at the sales figures, um, Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur is below the line to be canceled. It's below that cutoff line of around 20,000 copies. However, it's selling tons of copies on Amazon and through Scholastic. There was an interview on ICV2 where the one of the head muck and a muck set at Marvel was saying that through um, through Scholastic their number one selling book is Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur and that's how Runaways stayed selling so long even though it was below the cutoff line because the, the uh, digest size trade paperbacks were selling so well next to the manga books and that's why Runaways kept getting you know series after series after series it's not just sales in direct market for for uh, a Marvel book. If it's selling really well outside of the direct market, they'll keep it going as long as they can because Marvel wants to bring in more readers. And there are a couple people who I, I've read online with Twitter, you know, the people who get really mad, oh, they're, they're replacing Iron Man with a, an African-American girl. This is an affront to me. A better Better than a teenage version of himself. Yeah, it could have been far, far worse. And uh, so they're seeing that Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur sells really, really well. Why not try another book like that? Why not uh, Ms. Marvel sells so well outside of the direct market and in trade paperbacks? Why not try to work on that audience? It's not taking away from your Avengers and your, and your, your, um, your X-Men and your Spider-Man. It's adding new readers. Besides, if and it ends what up... What the hell's wrong with adding new readers? If it ends up like Red Wolf, where nobody reads it, just can it at issue six to a trade paperback, call it even. Yeah. Yo, I read Black Knight on the Marvel Unlimited five-issue miniseries. 
I wouldn't have paid for it, but reading it on there, yeah, it was entertaining enough. It was okay. You know, they had some cool ideas in it. Same with Red Wolf. You know what? Character's been sitting around for a long time. Eh, throw it against the wall. See if it works. If it doesn't work, as long as you don't lose money, who cares? But as for DC gaming the numbers, well, yeah, because their job is to sell comics. If Marvel could figure out a way to trick people into buying 300,000 copies of the new X-Men book, they'd do it. Put uh, C- Selena Gomez on the cover. That'll do it. I don't think so. Oh, I do. And it, it, Covers don't sell comics. That one might. <laughs> uh, but that's not what I wanted to talk about today. It isn't? No. Oh. Do you even read your emails? E what? Okay. Actually, what I wanted to talk about is online. There oh, are I bet who... I bet you want to. I, I got a topic. We should talk about what would make someone like you and I drop a series. You know, and we can even. Oh, I like that. We can even go into like like when when I had the shop. Uh, what would make me drop a shop, and even maybe get into like what when we were younger like last week, and uh, talk about... I think that's a cool idea. Yeah, never last. <laughs> yeah, but it'll last long enough to get through this here episode. Woo-hoo! And that's what we're all about, kids. Well, let's actually... I will start, because I, I just want to look as a, what I've been taken up to doing, and this is mostly Images full, because every so often they would have series that would not be published monthly, and then I would inevitably... You know, I'll probably order issue one, issue two, and then issue five, and then I go, do I'm missing a few. So every month I write down in a notebook what I'm ordering, and then I also talk about things that I'm going to stop. For example, in the last couple months, uh, Silver Surfer, I'm going to stop. Not because I don't like it. Well, actually, I haven't read it since issue one came out, but we talk a lot about... Uh, uh, Marvel Unlimited. I'll catch it on that. Poe Damien, the Star Wars character, just, it's not, it doesn't got me. It doesn't get me. I, I don't, and that's something I'm into. Uh, I stopped Grant Morrison's uh, graphic India material because I tried to read the first couple issues and I was really lost. I mean, it's art. It's really good. I just have no idea who the characters are, despite the, the memory puts in the back. Maybe it'll read better as a uh, graphic novel. Black Panther I stopped. Uh, I stopped a lot of the DC books. I picked them up for the rebirth just to give them a shot. But a lot of it nowadays, I think, is is mostly just money. And then I look at it like, Am I enjoying this? I mean, when I get my box day once a month, is it something like, oh, my gosh, I have to read this now or I'm going to my head's going to explode? Or is it just something like, eh, you know, Warren Ellis is James Bond. I'll just put it to the side. You know, I'll, I'll read it eventually when I get to it. And when we get to my eBay, I'll tell you the folly of that. But that's kind <laughs> of why I would stop an issue now. Even something that I really enjoyed, like uh, Gene Ha's May from Dark Horse. You know, I, w- I went with the Kickstarter. I enjoy the book. But I keep thinking, you know, this would be better as a graphic novel. And maybe I'll just wait. I think for me, because I've switched over mostly to digital and trades, one of the big things is I'm only reading books by creators I enjoy. If it's something where I, you know, it's a creator I don't know or something like that, I'm going to wait and get reviews and hear about it. You know, tons and tons of image books are coming out. And many of them, I've decided to wait until they're done because they are long form stories. Some of them I don't wait. Like Saga, I read that as each trade comes out. But for even books that I really like, like Velvet, oh, okay, I'll wait till it's all done, then I'll read it then, because I don't want to read and then stop and have to wait for six months, seven months, a year for the next part. 
It's why I quit reading fantasy novels and science fiction novels, because it's, oh, this is book one of five, and you're going to have to wait till next year for part two, Ooh. and then two years for part three, and well, just like, maybe uh, part five will never come just out. Just like Civil War number five. <laughs> Although Civil War, well, the other book, um, Dark Knight, Dark Knight keeps getting delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed. And I'm glad that I waited on that as well, because I'm sorry, you take two, three months between a comic, yep, it's probably going to be better, but I'm not going to remember everything, and I'd rather just read it all at once. I read I read S Secret War. Read um, When I heard that the last issue was coming out, okay, I'm going to read these eight, and then only waited a week for part nine made a hell of a lot more sense than the people I talked to who read it and then waited a month and read it and waited a month and read it and waited mm -hmm. two months. And and I think more and more, for me, I've always been someone who likes to do that. The only reason I will drop a book is if the creative team changes. And over at Marvel, when the creative team changes, they end the series. So... I like that. Over at Marvel, if a creator leaves a book, it ends, because they pretty much now, if um, creator A comes on a book, like, uh, like the new Captain America series, Nick Spencer came on and said, here's the story I'm going to tell, here's how long it's going to be, and boom, there you go, there's your run. Maybe it'll be 25 issues, maybe it'll be 30, maybe it'll be 50. But he's just going to do that, and then when it's done, they cancel it and start with the new number one. Over at DC, because I'm picking all of those up by trade paperback, I really don't stop a series until a story is done. That's usually what I try to jump off. You know, a lot of times, it's not so much I notice jumping off point. It's when they say, new storyline starting. Okay, I'm going to drop it. <laughs> and there are times I'll, I'll turn around and like, a couple times with the uh, Silver Surfer, I'd turn around and just go, uh, okay, I'll buy it again. <laughs> Some of them I hold off on. Like, I know people raving about Howard the Duck and uh, Patsy Walker. And, but I'm just like, nah, I just got to pick and choose, you know, which ones I really enjoy more than anything. Or which ones I just want to wait and pick up the graphic novel. And there was also one of the things that I've talked about is time. You know, with uh, Marvel Unlimited, I could read every Marvel comic published. But no, no one has time for that. As long as you got a job, you don't have time for that. <laughs> so in a lot of ways, it's like, oh, okay, well, uh, maybe I'll read that. Maybe I won't. Maybe I'll dig into the. Oh, I have some time. I'll, I'll catch up on this. Like the Inhumans. I didn't care at all about the Inhumans. But I was at the group home one night, and I couldn't sleep. So it's, uh, you know, they've got the first seven issues of Uncanny and the first five of All New. Oh, okay. Uncanny's really, really good. All New is kind of mediocre. I'll keep reading Uncanny. All New will be like, eh, if I have time. But a lot of books that I'm buying are so creator-focused, like Nights at the Dinner Table. I can't see ever dropping that. Uh -uh. Unless Jolly Blackburn hands it over to, you know, d d d Bob the intern. <laughs> well, Bob's a pretty talented guy. I don't know, man. Even Jolly's having trouble keeping track of everything he's done in the past. You know, and that's the first book out of my box that I always read. I mean, I would, I would, if I, if for some reason, and it was close a couple of weeks ago when my box of comics disappeared, I almost thought of just, okay, that's it. I'm not buying another comic. I'm just going to deal with the ones I have or do comicology or something else. But that would be one I would probably always pick up just because I enjoy it thoroughly. Now, back when you owned the shop, you, know, you had access. You could read everything. Oh, I heard those were the days. <laughs> What was it at that point that made you drop a book where you go, ah, I'm not going to bother to read that anymore? Read it or buy it for the shelf? Well, buying, it for the sh buying stuff for the shelf, that's a retailer decision. 
I mean you as a reader going, ah, no, I'll still put this up on the shelf, but I'm not reading it anymore. I'm not going to waste my time. You know, I don't recall many things that I wouldn't read. I'd almost have to dig up a pile of uh, lists of comics that, like, came out. Uh, A lot of times, like, when I had the big store, I had the luxury of at least looking at everything. You know, a lot of the X titles escaped me. I just had no real interest in them. And the little store was a little easier. Uh, sometimes the only copy I would order would be for myself, and I'd end up putting it on the shelf to see if it would even sell. And if it did, pick one up either through Diamond again or, you know, I was trading heavily with the source and the other hot comics too. But, yeah, I, for reading... I think I read almost every Marvel DC. I mean, the big thing I watched is make sure I didn't have the only copy in my pile. That copy could be on the shelf that someone could buy. So at least I could whip through everything, at least have an idea where it was going or what it was doing. I think if you had to talk about one thing, it's just the 90s and, you know, most of the X titles, I don't recall. Don't think I read a lot of Batman after they dealt with the uh, the whole Ezreal taking Batman's place. Yeah, that got... Batman became very event-oriented after that. It was every year it's going to be this huge crossover that's going to take, you know, three to six months. Like, um, what, the infection, and then the cataclysm, and then yeah. No Man's Yeah, I think Land most of and... those I didn't read. I was aware of I, what was going on, but I just, I mean, I lumped them together on the shelf, and I don't think I ended up uh, reading many of them. For me during that time, because comics were cheaper, and and I had more time, what would make me drop a book was either this, this they would make stupid decisions with the story, or the art would just turn terrible. And I always use the example of... Um, the Fantastic Four under Tom DeFalco and Paul Ryan. Ryan's art, while there are times I liked it, it got really kind of sketchy and and, and really just ugly. But DeFalco's stories just got dumber and dumber and dumber. It was like, okay, the Invisible Woman's gonna, you know, she's a woman in her thirties who's had a kid. She's going to run around with a costume that has a cutout for her belly. Oh, my. <laughs> and then the, the Reed Richards is going to die in a way that he could be brought back easily. And they're like, ah, well, OK. And they did right before uh, Heroes. Uh, what did they call it? Onslaught. Yeah, the onslaught. Before the onslaught. Thing, yeah. But it was, ah, yeah, he's dead. <laughs> and then they it, this is the other thing that would piss me off to no end. When they would do something like that and then endlessly tease undoing it. Because like every three issues, oh, here, here's, we found the evidence that Reed Richards is alive. Oh, wait, no, it was a ruse. Oh, wait, no, it was his dad. Oh, wait, no, it was this. And I think that's what always pissed me off about Green Lantern. I, I didn't like how they brought in Kyle Raymond. I thought that it was a bad story. And go back and read it now, and it's a terrible story. And you could tell that it was rushed and put together over a weekend. <laughs> but then they would have uh, Hal Jordan show up and, you know, zero hour. I'm going to fix everything. Oh, cool. Oh, wait, no, he didn't. And he became your your generic ha bad guy. Oh, you know, it's uh, we're, we're bringing him back again, and he's seen the error of his ways. Oh, wait, no, it was all a trick. And when they do stuff like that, it's almost like it's a wrestling match, and the good guy's about to win, and the bad guy just pokes him in the eye. Yoink. Except the, the good guy is the reader, and the bad guy is the creative team, and they're like, stupid. You're so stupid for believing us. And it just would go on and on and on and on and on. And then there were times where the art in a comic would just get unreadable. I'm looking back when I went through, um, what was that series, Starburst, the crossover with Quasar and the Silver Surfer and Thor, and 
that brought the new universe into the the Marvel universe. Boy, some of those like Namor was unreadable. I couldn't read it. The was art that the, was so the man- manga Namor or no, the one in the nineties after Jay Lee left. Oh, and after John Byrne left, and it was just it was you know ugly. The this. Figures were all distorted, and the panels, it looked like somebody had cut up panels and thrown them on a page and said, you figure it out. I don't fucking know. <laughs> and Quasar was just so poorly drawn that it's everything just looks bad. And it didn't help that the stories weren't any good, but it got to the point where it didn't matter if the story was good or not. It's, I can't read this. And if I can't read it, why am I buying it? And I'm not talking about, oh, you know, I can't read it because it's bad. No, I literally don't know where to look on this page for the next panel. And when you look on uh, Marvel Unlimited on some of that stuff, I, you know, unless your tablet's the, the size of a Buick, <laughs> you can't figure out what's going on. Crosshatch that baby a little more. But no, it wasn't the crosshatching. It was just... The guy's arm would be bigger around than his torso, and his other arm would be, you know, the size of his leg, and they'd be in a weird pose that wasn't human, and you didn't know what the hell was going on. And they, they here's one of my big complaints: the panel, pl- the balloon placement. When you read a comic, you read up, down, left, right. But it would be, okay, the balloon over here, up, oh, now I have to go over here to read this balloon, up, oh, now I have to go back to read this balloon, and then down, and then over here, and then up, and then around. One of the things in the 70s that a lot of the people who worked at Marvel said their biggest problem was balloon placement. They would have to go through, when they were assistant editors, and make sure that the balloons were placed properly so that people could follow because everything was so wordy. And by the 90s, you know, they they just didn't care. It's get this shit out the door. You know, they were publishing tons and tons of books. And that's when I would drop a comic. But to get me back on a comic, you would have to do a big deal. You would have to have a big creative team change. Like when, um, and I know people like this run, and I know they're going to be mad when I say it, but Mark Grunewald's Captain America was such a pain in the ass that I couldn't read it. Yeah, it came and went. And it took Mark Wade and Alan Kubert to come back. On, no, it was uh, Ron Garney. It took Mark Wade and Ron Garney to come on the book for me to pick up Captain America again. And the same with the X-Men. I dropped it with the Age of Apocalypse. It took Grant Morrison to get me back on the book. With the Fantastic Four, it took... Um, Chris Claremont, actually. Chris Claremont. I liked his run on the Fantastic Four. I think I picked up Walt Simonson's run, and then after that, it was just... I think think Mark Wade. Yeah, Mark Wade was... Whoa, that's almost 20 years later. I know. (laughs) (laughs) I I think another one was like the, uh, the run between New Mutants, right when Rob Liefeld jumped in and brought in Cable. Yeah, I mean that was one that I started picking up again, and sales went up for that too. Well, I wish I had some of that first appearance of Deadpool lying around my collection. <laughs> That's the thing everybody forgets. Oh, Rob Liefeld, he's terrible. He sucks. Yeah, well, at the time he sold books. Oh, and when that X, they canceled New Mutants to bring X Force. Woo! How many copies you need? How many? Co- well, one to open, one to keep sealed, and five to make sure I had the complete card set. <laughs> So before you had a shop, what would make you drop a comic when you were a young Boy, creator? That's a, I mean, a young collector. That's a tough one because I, I don't recall dropping books. Uh, I know I had a love-hate affair with Superman because I was always aware of Superman's importance in the scheme of comics. But some of those stories were just terrible. And uh, I think, like, Saga of the Swamp Thing was another one. You know, I picked it up, dropped it. Oh, my gosh, it was terrible. And then I think by the time 
uh, Swamp Thing 30 came around and this new guy, what was his name, Alan Moore? Maury? Yeah, some British yeah, guy. Yeah, I mean, it never last. And then I had to jump back and pick those up. Uh, heck, even with Sandman, I remember reading the first issue and largely incomprehensible to my brain. Didn't pick it up till Seasons of the Mist. Uh, Doom Patrol was the same way. I mean, I picked it up as soon as Grant Morrison came on it, but I tried those early issues. It was just, uh, you know, again, like with Superman, it would be like, okay, they're doing this thing where they split Superman powers in half, and it was kind of interesting. It actually tied into the Teen Titans, and then he got together and it was over, and the next issue was just blah. Even the uh, the run of, uh, oh, who was it, with Neil Adams? The Kryptonite No More. No, that wasn't Neil Adams. He was doing the covers. Kryptonite No More. It was a good storyline, and then as soon as that ran its course, boom. Oh. Yeah, then it, you know, back to normal. Well, a few things still change. He still worked for a TV station instead of a newspaper. Um the whole Morgan Edge storyline got dropped because that was from the New Gods. Yeah, yeah I remember Morgan asking Edge. you about that because when I read the hardcover I got, it's like, wait, I don't remember him being part of that uh, uh, conspiracy. Yeah, Morgan Edge was a minion of Darkseid. Well, that explains Fox. Yeah, Kirby introduced him. Good job. Because they... When Kirby went over to D.C., one of the things they wanted him to do was kind of revitalize the Superman stuff. Because, much like with Batman, you know, after the Batman TV show, sales on it just collapsed, and they were like, well, we can't keep doing what we're doing. So they did more of the Denny O'Neill, Neil Adams, Batman stuff, and sort of darkened the character. Um, it was also a time when that sort of gothic horror yeah, early 70s gothic horror was really big, and DC kind of went all in on it. You know, they had a bunch of horror comics. They even tried, um, they tried a gothic romance comic series. Um, <laughs> what was it? Dark Secrets of the Forbidden Mansion yeah, or something yeah, like that. I had that. a couple of those, mostly because I picked them up because the covers were just phenomenal. Yeah, they were fully painted covers. They thought that they could be able to latch into that audience because even as a kid I remember my grandmother was a huge reader of romance novels and all of them were you know it's dark and and it, there's a castle and the, the, the man's got a mysterious past and and then you know you had the dark shadows soap opera and edge of night and it was kind of a big deal for a while and even in comics horror was big from like 1970 to 76. And then something happened where the horror sales just dropped off. You know, DC continued to do their horror anthology books, but Marvel, pretty much all theirs were gone. And uh, Tomb of Dracula limped along for a few more years. Werewolf by Night was canceled. Uh, the, the Frankenstein's Monster, The Living Mummy, all of those got canceled. The horror magazines got canceled. That oftentimes is what got me is when, you know, a series would get canceled. And a lot of times, you know, nowadays we know something's being canceled before it's even printed. Back then it would be like something would disappear. I remember being confused why there was no uh, Logan's Run 8. You know, it's just like it disappeared and never came back and no one gave And you heard the story. You yeah, heard I've, the story behind I've that, I've hit right? you up with it a couple of times and... Oh, we don't have the rights to it. Oops. We don't have the rights to do this? Crap. Oh, but we did so well with Star Wars. <laughs> well, no, Logan's Run was before Star Wars. Well, what would get you to drop a title in your youth? Um, If the creative change was really big and it was a minor character. Um. Uh, because Spider-Man, we've talked in the past where after Marv Wolfman left, the series just floundered for about two years. And I just, I, I didn't enjoy it, but ah, oh, it's Spider-Man, and you yeah. have to read Spider-Man because it's one of the core stories. Or, um, what was another one that I read even though I didn't? Oh, Thor. After Roy Thomas left and they brought in, um, 
Oh, who was it? I don't know, because I didn't start it reading it. It was Doug Mensch, and I don't remember who the artist was. But it's like, oh, these stories are terrible, and they don't tie in with anything, and what the hell is wrong with them? And I, I did, I actually did drop Thor, but then picked it back up when Walt Simonson yeah, came on. See, I never picked up Thor. I tried to, but I didn't get it. And then uh, I didn't pick it up for good until Simonson was doing it. But it went from like, oh, Roy Thomas and John Buscema and Keith Pollard are doing this you know, really big story where they're bringing the Eternals into the Marvel Universe. Then after that, it's like, oh, it's a bunch of uh, one-part stories where d- d- nothing happens. And Thor's not in Asgard anymore, and I don't care. Or I came real close to dropping the Fantastic Four when Doug Mensch and Bill Sienkiewicz did it. But it's, ah, oh, it's the Fantastic Four. I can't drop the Fantastic Four. See, I think I picked up issue 200. And I might have picked up the one where Submariner was in it. I think I tried the Galactus story. But it wasn't until Burn came that I actually collected it, you know, nonstop. And yeah. even then, I think I, I wrote it to issue 300 and then dropped. Because we talked about how Burn had just dropped. And the story just kind of floundered on. I think I picked up a few because I do remember the one issue where uh, they they claim that Forever Man, no, Molecule Man's a uh, uh, Aaron Cube, and so is the Young Beyonder, and they yes. went through the Secret Wars three. Yeah, yeah, and they went through that dimension that had the Beyonders, which no one could comprehend, um, which I thought was cool for what it was, but. I come to think of it, that Beyonder, he's out there somewhere. Well, no, there were a race of them. Yeah, the race they... is gone, but the young Beyonder came back, and nobody knows. He hasn't been seen since. I forget which series he came back. I was reading the Wikipedia trying to catch up with it. Oh, okay. And he apparently had come back, and then, but he, he hasn't made himself known since. I'm going to have to reread Secret Wars because I know that they tie in with the Beyonders in that. Or it's in the build-up to it, which that's one thing. The build-up. Uh, well, the build-up in the two Avengers the, books that were and the first, done by uh, uh, Hickman. Yeah, yeah, the first issue of Secret Wars. And it's funny when you look back now and everything Hickman did tied in with the Secret Wars – he told one long story that started in his run on the Ultimates. Now that's planning. <laughs> that's well, impressive. That's why it was so much fun to read, too. And it's funny to me when I read older fans who talk about, oh, Hickman stuff on the Fantastic Four, I didn't like it, and it didn't make any sense. And it reminds me of when people say that Grant Morrison's just weird to be weird. It's like, no, it makes sense. You like the Silver Age stuff. He's writing Silver Age comics. With Hickman, he wasn't writing Silver Age comics, but he was writing, you know, big story, big cosmic stuff. He just wasn't doing it the way you're used to. But but a lot of stuff in the 70s that I liked, it would just get canceled. And I accepted creator changes thinking, oh, well, that's what they had planned. But I do remember I dropped Ghost Rider when um, Tony Isabella left because the stories became just boring superhero stories. And his, I'm sorry, Ghost Rider's villains in the 70s were terrible. (laughs) The Orb, the Water Wizard. (laughs) It's like, uh, sure makes sense. The Water Wizard against a guy with Hellfire? Yeah, but Hellfire doesn't burn like real fire. It burns your soul. Because I remember in that story, you know, it's like, why is it the water putting your, your fire out? Because it's Hellfire. Ugh. And Nicolas Cage hasn't gotten to me yet. <laughs> yeah, the new Ghost Rider on, uh, on uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Not going to be the Nicolas Cage version. Aww. No, sorry. It's going to be the new version. But back then, it really had to be a big change for me to drop. 
And usually it was because I only had so much money. Defenders, when it switched over to uh, Keith Giffen doing his pseudo-Kirby, and then after that, Ed Hannigan was just putting out generic Marvel whatever. It's like, yeah, I don't care about these characters if they're not written by Steve Gerber, because the, the Gerber made them weird, and this is just boring. <laughs> when you, you talk the pseudo-Kirby, I think I remember uh, Ron Friends doing Thor, and I think I wrote that out till... Issue 300? Or was it 400? One of the 400. Three. Yeah, 400. That would be a place that I would stop because back as when I was young, I had the collector mentality. You know, I actually dreamed that someday I might own every single Marvel ever published. And had I started earlier than later, I probably would have done it. But there were times. Then where, you'd Jerome. Ah, I got it all, let me tell you. And I'd take a few coverless too. <laughs> I gotta tell you, when the con comes up, I'll have to ask him what his magic number is. Twenty-two. Last time yeah, I talked, yeah. and I he it probably be down again. But I mean, it's just the idea that I I would miss an issue. And back then, you know, we were talking what? Uh, and it started. I started at like twenty-five cents, going to thirty. You know, it's so much difficult now. I mean, even what we talked about in the beginning, I'm just like, oh man, four bucks for this. I read it in two minutes and. <laughs> Why am I bothering? And back then, you know, with a quarter, I remember a comic would last about 20 minutes. Now, for, they were terribly overwritten, but you also, you would read everything. You'd read the letters pages, you'd read the bullpen bulletins, you'd read the ads. All of it. Yeah, I thought that bullpen bulletins was like a newspaper. <laughs> Stan's Soapbox. Oh, you'd look forward to that every month. Excelsior. And going back, you know, it gave Marvel an identity that DC didn't have. DC tried with direct currents later on. And when I go back and read that, it's like, oh, yeah, they're trying to do the bullpen bulletins. But they're really... DC was not as good as at hyping as Marvel would do. Because you look back, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, the Legion of Superheroes is going to get their own book. Whereas Marvel, epic. You no, know, it was... Odyssey is coming. Then a couple months later, it would be, it's not Odyssey anymore, it's epic, and it's going to be the biggest thing to ever happen. So that by the time they announced what it was, you were like, oh my god, i got to have it. I'm trying to remember when I started switching from just picking things off the shelf to pre-ordering. I think I know it was with Advanced Comics, and it probably tied in when Gruber and I started buying things to sell at cons. I know we were doing that by the time Crisis and Secret Wars hit. Might have even been uh, like Megaton Man. I remember Pat talks about the time he he was supposed to get a certain number of copies because he pre-ordered them. And then, of course, the guy who was running the shop for John didn't pull them for Pat. I mean, he was spectacularly uncooperative of getting Pat these copies. Of course, judging by the way Megaton Man it is now, probably a good idea. But back then, you know, you get that stuff, and we would sell it at cons, and uh, we tried a few comic book buyer guides to add. So, you know, you start doing that. Of course, Advanced Comics wasn't the cluster previews as now. When I, um, there was a mail order subscription service from the shop down in Texas called Camelot. And I remember I signed up for that because the Micronauts and Moon Knight had become direct sales only. I remember that. Yeah. So I had a subscription service with them. And then um, when I discovered the comic shop in Galesburg, I immediately signed up for a subscription. I mean, I w the second time I went there. You know, they had a subscription service, and I gave them the list. And there were a couple times where I became one of those people who, I have too many damn comics. <laughs> I remember there was one time I had over $100 worth of comics. And this is like 83, 84, when comics were 75 cents each. I had over $100 worth of comics. It's like, crap, i got to work. i got to find more jobs. <laughs> I remember I used to $30 every two weeks from working house along. That was all went to comics. And I had enough for McDonald's afterwards. 
Yeah, we're I'd just be happy a bunch if I of, had enough for a pretzel we're afterwards. Just a bunch of old guys sitting around talking about comic books. Who oh, we love you. Just get off the grass. Your pants are a little too low. Let me get them a little higher. The other thing about DC, it was easier for me to dip in and out because their stories weren't as continued. This is pre-crisis. Their stories weren't as continued, and on some of the books, the creative team would be different every issue. You talked about Superman. It's like, okay, well, I'll buy Superman if Marv Wolfman writes a story, or if Gil Kane draws a story, or if George Perez does something. But, oh, look, it's Carrie Bates, and uh, who cares? I won't pick that one up. I remember Teen Titans coming out. That was hot. Everybody liked that. Well, and it was because, holy crap, that's where George Perez went. Yeah. Although he'd done the Justice League before that, and I got on to DC a little too late. I think the first Justice League issue I picked up was number 200. And he only did part of it. And then he his run after that was kind of scattered. He'd do two issues, and then somebody else would do one, and then he'd do three, and somebody else would do one. And by then, I'd kind of soured on Gary Conway. Because at Marvel, I really liked his stuff. And over at DC, it was more pick and choose because some of his DC stuff was really aggressively mediocre and some of it was good. I thought his uh, Justice League was kind of mediocre, but uh, man, Firestorm was good. Firestorm was like reading his old Spider-Man stuff. Yeah, Firestorm was fun. And it had Pat Broderick on it. And so, you know, that was fun stuff. But DC, it was easy for me to drop. It's like, oh, yeah, this, I, I don't know who these creators are, and this doesn't look good, yeah, whatever. I think I remember buying Batman for the longest time because the stories were interconnected, Batman Detective. And that was back when he was fight. I forget the name of the chick he was fighting. And it was all over getting... Uh, Nocturna. Nocturna. They were fighting for... Uh, they're fighting for Robin. Yeah, yeah. I, why can't I think of the name of the guy? Thief of Night was her minion. Yeah. I and there was even Robin. parts where it was like, well, Batman can't solve this, therefore Bruce Wayne will have to step in and do it. And it ended up being, oh, Jason Todd he ended up uh, doing a story where the origin was very similar to Robin, and then all of a sudden, out of yeah. nowhere, he was jacking... The Batmobile's hubcaps. That was a dropping point. Well, that was after Christ. That was, that a was dropping, after Christ. Yeah, but that was a dropping point. It was like, what the hell? Yeah. This thing, it, you know, just out of the blue, you change the storyline. No wonder I voted to cack the fucker. <laughs> You're the one. Uh, one of many. I voted to save him, actually. Could he two shoes? Damn right. No matter what anybody says. No, I thought... Killing Robin was a poor idea, especially since they'd spent like almost a year building him up to be a real shit heel. Uh, you, yeah, and then you know it was over when they like had him uh, let the hero, the one guy, drop to his death. Yeah, and then you know you go back and you read it, and it's oh well, even if he would have lived, they would have taken him out of the book for a couple of years because they wanted to do Batman solo stories. They wanted to do Batman without Robin. Uh, thank God Superboy punched the wall to bring back Hush. <laughs> See, sometimes there's good things happen. Although, um, no, he didn't come back in the Hush story. That was a, that was a trick from Hush. It was uh, the Red Hood story that came afterward. Ah, I'll have to go reread it. Sooner or later, I'll get my Hush uh, Absolute back from the girls, and I can reread it. No, because that was a misdirection. I remember at the time, everybody was like, oh, my God, and then a couple issues later, it's, oh, wait, no, it was all a trick. Okay, see, that's a, but that's, a, a, over that's a mopey to me. It never happened. Well, and it went over so well, that's why they brought him back. At least Uncle Ben's still dead. Wait, is Uncle Ben still dead? I didn't even know he was sick. Oh, God. <laughs> you know who's not sick, Joe? Let, let, let me try that okay. again. You know who's not sick, Joe? A uh, person that has ugly thoughts? No. No? These guys, our sponsors. Hooray. Yes, here at Solitaire Rose Networks, we have ads. That's right, we have ads. 
just like every other podcast. Come on, it's okay. Our first advertiser is our longest-running advertiser, and that's DreamHost.com. DreamHost.com is the best bar none web host all over the interwebs. You could go to other web hosts. You could go to the ones that have big ads on TV and everything, and they're not going to give you the service, the dependability, and and the reliability of DreamHost. Head on over to DreamHost.com. Use the code CRAZY, K-R-A-Y-Z, and get $20 off your first year of web hosting. Another of our sponsors is Dollar Shave Club. Dollar Shave Club has great blades at low prices, and let's face it, you gotta shave. Head over to shaved.by slash C19DC, get you some blades, they're wonderful, I use them, I use all of our sponsors. Matter of fact, head on over to crazycomics.com, over on the uh, right hand side of the page, you'll see all of our sponsors, Bombas, Grays, Flaviar, Dollar Shave Club, and DreamHost. If you would like to advertise on any of the podcasts in the Solitaire Rose Network, you can just email solitairerosenetwork at gmail.com, subject advertising. And after we do the sponsors, we ask Joe what's going on on the Ebays. All right, are you ready? This is going to be a rapid fire Ask the Strode. Oh, Lord. Number one, Strode, tell me about Thanos the Infinity Abyss. Uh, That is one of the three hardcover original graphic novels that Marvel let Jim Starlin do. He did three um, hardcover graphic novels and a miniseries to sort of wrap up his Thanos story. Actually, it was a a six-issue miniseries in uh, uh, 2002. Oh, okay. Starlin and Al Milgram. But I think they used it again. I got the names mixed up. Yeah, Yeah, I got the names mixed up. See, Strode doesn't know all. Okay, how about... Max Brewer, Universal Soldier. That I don't know. Yeah, I wouldn't either. It's from Fleetway, 1993, so obviously... Uh, well, Fleetway I, reprinted a lot of the 2000 AD stuff, so it's oh, probably a British it. series. Yeah. yeah. And I am sadly ignorant on a lot of the British stuff. I've read 2000 AD from time to time. Um, I have a lot of trouble with the anthology format because it's, okay, this is a nine-part series and this is a six-part series, and and it's hard to keep up, especially now when in the U.S. they just come out in monthly chunks. Yeah, you never know when it's going to ship. And, you know, like I said, I can't read everything. The 2000 AD stuff I've read, I, I'd say about half okay. of it I enjoy. Well, how about Die Cut versus G-Force? Yeah, that was a Marvel um, UK. Marvel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How about I, I, Ape Nation? Ape Nation was a miniseries at uh, DC, correct? Nope, it was a one. Oh wait, no, no, that was um, Malibu doing a uh, Planet of the Apes series. Yeah, yeah, crossover with Alien Nation. Yep, you mentioned that in the past. How about Aria? Am I saying it right? Aria. A- Is that the Image series? Correct. Should be giving points. How about Bloodbath? Oh, God. Okay, he remembers. It's a bad DC uh, sequel to uh, Bloodlines. Yes, it's the Bloodlines sequel no one wanted. It's one of those things where when they announced it, it's like, oh, they're bringing back all the Bloodlines characters. How about... No one's going to give a shit. Bold Adventure. I'll give you a hint. It's a Pacific comic. That's what I was going to say. It was a Pacific anthology yep, book, wasn't it? three issues. Let's see, what else we got here? Uh, how about Captain Armadillo? Oh, that sounds like something somebody published with their lunch money. I think you're right, because although I could not find it in either uh, Overstreet's comic book price guide, nor could I find it in uh, Slings and Arrows comic guide. However, it is it was listed in Atomic Avenue. Although they don't list issue number five, which is weird because the only thing you can find on eBay is issue number five. And issue I have a question for an obscure comic from the from the eighties. Mm-hmm. You've got Atomic Avenue open. Oh no, I don't actually. I'm just going off my. Uh, oh wait, here it is. Okay. Look up Death Craze Teenage Superheroes. Death Craze. I didn't even have to go too far. Just put Death and C. Uh, Arf Arf is the name of the two issues, 1986 from Jim Erskine. Ersk- Erskine. Black and white tale featuring teens thrust into a new world similar to Marvel's new universe of the late 80s. 
I actually really liked that book. Even though, you know, it was very much two people who had never done anything before, and I really doubt if any of them did yeah. anything. No, they're just two, two issues that you can buy them as low as 59 cents a piece. And Erkstein, uh, I doubt he did anything else. But it was actually a really fun little, uh, I almost call it a fanzine, but I, I liked it. But it came out during that 80s black and white boom where, you know, if you were able to scrape up 300 bucks and go to a publisher, uh, oh, yeah. one of the distributors would pick you up. Now, the reason I mention all these in rapid fire sequence is because I spent most of the afternoon putting a lot of these titles plus a whole lot more on eBay as I'm slowly going through my vast accumulation of crap and weeding out things I'm going to keep versus things that I probably will never read, <coughs> bloodbath, and then things that you... Armadillo, Captain Armadillo. I don't know where I picked that up. I don't know if I bought that from the creator or or maybe it was just one of those packs I picked up out of somebody's uh, thing. Issue number four is like 20 bucks both on Atomic Avenue and on eBay because it has Elvis in it. So, you know, go figure. And there's absolutely no description of it. Although, if you would... Hang on a half a second. Let me uh, step Whip over this to out. the box of wonder where I have stored all these things. Let's see if I can find it here. Good thing I used the alphabet because I don't know where the hell it went. Oh, here we go. The cover, actually, this is probably why I bought it because it goes, The Adventure Begins. See an ordinary comic book collector mir miraculously transformed into an idiot in a stupid armadillo suit. <laughs> So that alone was probably why I bought it. Um, it could have been something. What, what year was this published? Let me take a look. Nineteen eighty-seven. So that was before the comic shop, which means I probably picked it up as a at a con or something. Because I can't believe I would have picked this off the shelf by itself. But all that stuff I just put on eBay. The deal, of course, is if you do see something you like on eBay, let me know, and I'll take something out of my vast accumulation of crap. It could be, well, I got I got four candidates right here. I could give you, for free, the Rising Stars one half, or maybe the Spider Gwen number one uh, action figure, or maybe one of the Howard the Duck variant covers, because these all have no value on eBay, so what the hell am I going to do with them? That's the way it rolls around here. And I will make one special offer because, as you know, a couple of podcasts ago, the recording stopped as we were uh, getting into the freaking and geeking with uh, Angel, Angel Medina. Medina. Yeah. One of the things I had mentioned about, and this is uh, upcoming freaking, is that I had had a flat tire on my truck and found out three out of the four tires were shot. One could not be fixed, so I'm using my spare, and one has a very, very slow leak, so I started to half price all the variant covers in order to uh, raise a little quick cash to pay for tires. Because I don't know if you've bought in tires lately, but they're damn expensive. So I will make this deal for you guys, and this is just for the listeners of this here show. Go through my vast accumulation of crap and on eBay, and if you see something you're interested in, if I can, I'll cut it to you for half price and get it to you. Because I, I initially did a sale on just my variant covers, and that sale will end uh, probably by the time you listen to this here podcast. But I'll make that deal for you up until the following podcast. If you see something you like, send me an email on it via eBay. You know, you basically just you, you go to the uh, whatever the listing is, and somewhere on there it says contact uh, the uh, uh, seller. And then when it comes to me, just say, hey, I listened to this show. I'd like to know if I can get this for half price. It could be a Mighty Avengers number one signed by Frank Cho that's been sitting in my collection, uh, I don't know, for the last five years. Sure, I'd have price it for you, but just you, no one else. Don't be, don't be spreading this around. This is just between you and me. I would even... And don't get greedy. Well, no, get greedy. Buy it all. But anyway, <laughs> K-R-A-Y-Z... Have some fun, and uh, like I said, I'll be adding stuff between here and now. I've got a good head of steam, and, uh, you know, at, at least I'll have that eBay store cranking until next year because the plan is is not uh, this Falcon or not 
the spring con beyond that, which is May 20th, 21st, so mark it. But the fall con, if there's going to be one next fall, I'm going to bring everything and just blow it all out like my old buddy Pat did. So we'll see if that well, happens. No, Pat, does, does Pat have a table at the convention this No, fall? he doesn't. He's just going to be wandering around kind of like me. Nothing to do, nowhere to go, nothing to, no one to talk to, all alone. Well, if you're going to talk about the convention, I'm going to run to the bathroom. Oh, okay, go ahead. All right. All right. Now, while Corey's at the bathroom, I'll, I'll continue my rant from last week, because what you remember, you know, I was telling you why I was so torqued that Corey's not going to Falcon, which is the One Day Wonder, October 8, 2016, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. at the Minnesota State Fair Education Building, with advanced tickets on sale, and they got their guest list up, so www.mcvacomiccons.com. One of the guests of Corey is Dangerous Dan Moore, who's going to have a book there of Corey and his uh, web strip. I think it was a weekly wide world web something or other. And, of course, Corey, since he bailed on the con, won't be there to sign the initial run of that comic, which I think is utterly folder carb, which is a battle of Star Galactica swear word, because I figure for all the advice we've given everybody over these past years, that's one you don't want to miss at a con, your first books. And seriously, if Corey's looking to make a living with his creativity as opposed to just doing it so his brain doesn't implode. He should make it. But he's not because he's got he's going to be going to a job. <sighs> Meanwhile, I will be there, table list, somewhere within the 33,000 square feet of awe-inspiring comic book wonderment. I will be there. There will be over 100 comic book creators, free parking, door prizes, free grab bags, and, of course, the Nick Post Scholarship Silent Auction. And one of the things I'll be proud to do is I'm going to mix together, I guess you could call it the remains of this awesome collection we got. It was actually Nick's Post personal comic book stock that was donated to the convention. And we, we sold some of it at the con. We've been using it at the charity table. And really, I've got a, a couple long boxes left and I'm going to put together the best of it, probably throw in some goodies like some of the stuff I mentioned, including maybe a, a variant from one of the Harley Quinn number ones that I picked up. And it'll be in the silent auction, probably starting at 50 bucks, but you know that box is going to be worth over $300 of variant covers. Plus there'll be a whole bunch of other fun stuff. They actually had a picture and uh, I, I think I heard Corey saunter on back. If not, I yes, okay. I have returned. I'm. Uh, Did you get it all out of your system yet? All uh, your, uh, I got about capping on me. I got about one more week left, but uh, okay. I just want to get to the MCBA's website because they posted. Oh wait a minute, it's in my friendly neighborhood Gmail. I think they got a. Is it a Phil Hester art piece that they'll be? Hang on, let me double check here. Oh, that's very exciting. Very exciting. Midwest comic book, there we go. And it's a, yep, a Phil Hester flash page that was donated by Mr. Hester that will be part of the uh, Nick Post Scholarship Fund. And, of course, what they do is they take the money they raise in the silent auction and they form a student scholarship with the Twin Cities' own Minneapolis College of Art and Design, or MCAT, comic art program. So... There, you got heads up on two of the cool things that are going to be there. The big old box of fun-loving variants and a uh, flash page by Phil Hester. So we will see you there. Well, sorry. I will see you there at Falcon, the One Day Wonder. And, of course, Corey, May 20th, 21st will be the con formerly known as Spring Con. So no excuses. Be there. Or maybe we'll just live blog from your a mobile home instead of being at the con. Hey, that's a thought. Oh, Lord. A 24-hour web... Here's Corey scraping across his carpet, looking at his sink, vainly for a clean dish so he can make himself a Pop-Tart. Hey, I do my dishes every night. And I do Pop-Tarts every night, so <laughs> it could work. I do not go to bed with a dirty dish in my house. He throws them out on the lawn. That's right. And if it rains, bonus. I had a cat. You know, you don't leave food around with a cat unless you want everything in your house lit. Although when I made vegetables, she would look at me as like, "Why? what are you doing putting that in your mouth? That's not food. 
Well, now that Joe's done all of his uh, capping on me, it's time for what we what, what I enjoy the most. No, 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 not the end of the show. It's freaking a geeking. Joe, what are you freaking on? That my best bud is not going to be at Falcon, the One Day Wonder, oh, October eighth, two thousand sixteen, ten a.m. to six p.m. at the Minnesota State Fair Education Building. And even though advanced tickets are on sale, well, go buy some. www.mcbacomiccons.com. I finally got it off work, and. Uh, that's pretty much the only thing I'm freaking on. I already talked about the flat tire thing. We got that special deal going for you. Uh, clone conspiracy is uh, is needs, is under ordered, so we need to order more. Uh, and I still haven't won the Powerball. Corey, what are you freaking on? Um, Joe, you were a big fan of Space Ghost, weren't you? Yeah. Space Ghost, coast to coast. Mm-hmm. C. Martin Croker who was uh, one of the voices and creative people and animators on that show, who was also heavily involved in a lot of uh, Adult Swim stuff, passed away over the weekend at age 54 from what I read. I I didn't read a whole lot because, you know, last thing I want to do is, hey, somebody who's uh, two years older than me just died. But it was a very quick illness. But he passed away, and it's one of those people who, unless you paid attention to credits, you didn't know. But I remember his stuff, you know, on on Space Ghost, and then on Cartoon Planet, and then on all of these other series that he was involved in. And in a lot of ways, he was one of the guys who sort of created the whole idea of Adult Swim. And I cannot go into how big a fan of uh, Space Ghost Coast to Coast I was. I thought it was one of the best series of the 90s. It was inventive, it was funny, it was fresh, it was exciting, and uh, him passing away, that's kind of sad. Yeah. And um, I one of the things that I found interesting is you know, I've been adding more and more people to my Facebook as I'm networking for the podcast, and, and stuff. How many people on my Facebook actually knew him and talked about what a great guy he was, how he was always funny in the office, how a lot of times they would just sit around and bat around ideas that never got on the air that would have been great series. So enjoy the stuff that people create for you because they're not going to be creating it forever. Um, the uh, next thing, I talked a little about it last week, but now it's in full effect at the group home. They are still shorthanded, Joe. But on overnights, now they are trying harder to get people to do awake overnights. So they have said they cannot have a person sign up for sleeping overnights <laughs> until the day before. Ah, stupid rules. So I have been getting a panicked email pretty much every day. Ugh, idiots. <laughs> I am doing the same amount of hours, if not more. It's just now it's a little more stressful, and I can't plan as well. So it's, uh, I know Friday they were like, oh my gosh, uh, can you do uh, tonight, Saturday night, and Monday night? Yes, I can do those shifts. Then today I get the email, can you do Tuesday night? Yes, I can do Tuesday night. And I finally said to them, can you at least give me an idea of when you're going to be asking for, so I can make some plans. No. As well, probably Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. (laughs) Okay. That means I have Tuesday and Wednesday. Cool. So so I've got that. Um, The the last thing I'm kind of freaking on is not comic-related, but, uh, you know, Joe, you don't have the cable. No. But I have the cable. And on the cable... We're getting these digital channels, and they don't add the digital channels quite as fast as they're being created here in the Twin Cities. So it's like a new digital channel will show up, and we don't get it for like four, five, six months. So I decided, why not just go buy one of those fancy-schmancy digital antennas? How fancy are you? And they had them on, on the Amazon and I'm smart enough to know that I am down, you know, I'm, I'm down in a valley. So I w- would probably need one that's uh, powered. So I got one that you can plug in, and then it supposedly it gets the signal better and everything. So I ordered it, and I set it up, and I did all the stuff you're supposed to do to get all the digital channels. And you know how many digital channels I got, Joe? Two. 
three. Ooh. I got uh, Channel 9, Channel 9.1, and Channel 9.2. Didn't even get all of Channel 9's channels. Did you get me, TV? The... No. no. I didn't get any of it. And and it's not that good either, because I started watching. And you ever watch the digital TV on your antenna when there's, you know, interference? So it's like, oh, there's a picture. Uh, now the picture did, it looks like uh, cable in the 80s when you were trying to watch a channel you didn't see. Oh, now there's a picture. Yeah, all of them are like that. So basically I flushed $24 down the toilet buying this digital antenna. Yeah, I don't really have that problem because I've got a pretty good line of sight to the digital antenna, which I believe our, ours is in Shoreview, those big three impossibly huge uh, TV antennas that have been there since I was a kid. I know Shoreview wants the land back so they can develop it, but uh, I don't know what will happen if they'll... Because if they take those things down, that will pretty much kill any TV signal for anybody. So they may government may step in and say, sorry, Shoreview, you don't get them. <laughs> and one thing that's kind of annoying, you know, I'm out here in Chaska. Joe, do you know where Watertown is? Uh, yeah, Chaska is annoying. I'm sorry, what? Do you know where Watertown is? Uh, I've heard of it, but I don't want to Google it. It's about 40 minutes northwest of me. Sounds like a bad tornado. They get all of the digital channels. I do not. Because you're in much a valley, valley yep. so low. <sighs> yes, I can, I, it, within 10 minutes, I'm right at the shores of the Minnesota River, but uh, no digital channels for Corey. Geeking, Joe, what are you geeking on? Woohoo! The Vikings win! I'm not a big football guy, but for some reason I was compelled to watch the Vikings uh, beat up Green Bay. Actually, they pretty much beat up each other. A lot of guys carried out injured, but every so often I, I get this urge to watch that I have to watch, which is unreal because usually I can't because I work. But I was home, it was Sunday night. And I figured, well, you know, somehow my tax dollars paid for this behemoth called the stadium. So I, I got to watch, and the game's always more fun when your home team wins. And now that they did, they got a used stadium, so I expect them to tear it down any day now and build another one. <laughs> On the subject of job, I, I, I guess we are not going to have that uh, uh, Joe find a job segment because I did pass my last test of the year. So I get to keep my job for another year. Don't, wor well, that's Don't worry, they're going to be testing me again next year to see if they can fire me after 15 years. But, you know, hey, what are you going to do? It's not like I can, uh, you know, quit and, and uh, ride a bus. Hey, wait a minute. I could. We'll get back to that. A couple uh, on the aforementioned uh, drop of freaking and geeking when we were talking to our good friend, Angel, uh, I mentioned... One of the books that I read was Wonder Woman Volume 1, the George Prez books, and I absolutely loved it. I think they covered, was it 12 or 13 issues in there? Basically the whole first run of stories. A lot of this stuff I don't recall. I mean, I read it. That was one of those things we talked about. What would get you reading Wonder Woman again? Well, George Prez doing it did it, and there were times I dropped it, and then I think uh, – did Diodato did the art for a while? Yeah. And that that was another pickup. And anyways, when George Perez was doing it, it was just phenomenal. I mean, he had a great sense of uh, mythology. The stories seemed grandiose, and they were a lot of fun. Plus, he ties into some of the, uh, the uh, was it Legends, I think, and Millennium that were occurring yeah. at the time, and they didn't really overtake the story. I think that it actually... I kept with Wonder Woman until uh, War of the Gods, which I've talked about in the past. The War of the Gods itself, if you can line up all 26 parts, it reads really well. But if you just read the crossover as it interferes with your book, skip it. If you're trying to just read War of the Gods 1 through 4, skip it. You need to really read it all. And I have no idea if War of the Gods was ever done as a, as a book or anything. But uh, I'll have to check that out. I reread from... Frumpy the Clown, which was uh, a short-lived, well, a couple of years, comic strip. 
that uh, Judge, oh, was it Judge? Judd Winnick. Winnick, thank you. Uh, fun stuff, if you have never read it before, Omni, I believe, published it. And if you get, Oni. Oni. O-N-I. Oni. 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 And not my fault they can't publish their, pronounce their name right. Oni. Boy. Anyways, they published it. It might be out of, but you might be able to pick up a copy. Two volumes, and uh, it is a lot of fun to read. In terms of newer stuff, uh, I'm doing my Christmas shopping already. I picked up the definitive biography of Joel by Fred Shures. Now, I'm a Billy Joel fan, but my brother's a bigger Billy Joel fan. So, And the odds of him listening to this podcast are probably zero since he hardly answers his email. He's a lot like Butch in my life. He comes in and disappears, although I know I can see my brother at least at Christmas time. Maybe Thanksgiving, never too sure about that. <laughs> really fascinating book. Uh, it tells me a lot about Billy Joel. I mean, the guy's down to earth, did not know. He says, you know, he, he's responsible for being in America. He owes it to the Nazis because a lot of his, his, apparently his grandparents fled the Nazis. Not all of his family got out alive, but uh, enough to, his grandparents did. They met up, uh, his mom, his dad, who was also fled, and uh, goes on, talks about his early history, uh, the anger that everybody says he has, why it is. But he actually, he comes down, he's just kind of a down-to-earth guy. It sounds like he doesn't let a lot of things really get to him as he goes through life. And there's also a sense of a lot of his music he wrote based on things in his life. And I found a lot of his music spoke to me as a fan as I'm listening to it. I mean, you know, when you're busy going out with a girl and you're listening to his song, Tell Her About It, you're like, oh, he might be talking to me about that. But then when you read about a lot of things in his life were actually being transmitted into his music. Take some of the wonderment out of it. It's almost like when I read, talked about the Charles Schultz biography I read a while back, knowing that, well, you know, Lucy was kind of patterned a little bit after his wife that was giving him a hard time. And when they finally divorced, that was like the last time Charlie Brown had a stomachache. A lot of this stuff in here, you know, Billy Joel talks about, Music-wise, takes away some of it, but it's just it's a fascinating book. I just some about biography books about you know creators and celebrities and people that I actually have enjoyed their work and care about. It's just fun to read, and I think this is done in lieu of an autobiography because Billy just decided I'm not doing it. So he basically just did hundreds of interviews with uh, Fred Schuers. So if you're a fan, it's worth picking up. I also took a quick visit back to uh, Astro City, picked up The Lover's Quarrel, which I believe was the last book that came out. And this one deals with uh, Cracker Jack. And uh, I can't think of the girl he's paired up with. But they, uh, it's kind of a aging superhero story, which is really fantastic. And then, of course, it has what Corey loves, monkeys in it. Well, great apes, but, you know. Astro Monkeys and apes are awesome. Astro City is one of those books that, you know, I reread every so often because there'll be little bits and things that he'll drop in earlier issues that are suddenly in the forefront that you might have missed the first time around. Other than those two, I really haven't read a lot. There were two comic series I, I talked about at our infamous Freaking and Geeking drop. The first one was Adam Hughes, Betty and Veronica, which I absolutely enjoy. It'd be interesting to see where he goes with this. And, of course, being that Adam Hughes is doing pretty much all of it, uh, it's a lot of fun. I've enjoyed the entire Archie line. See, that's one of those lines that, much as I'd like to quit, I just enjoy reading it, even though it is uh, $3.99 an issue. You can't quit them? I can't quit them. Just like Gru, Sergio Argonis and uh, Mark Avanier, their newest series from Dark Horse, Fray of the Gods. I normally I wait till I get the whole series, but I just I had to read them. Issue one and two, just as much fun as all the other stuff. I often figure, you know, I should probably just go back and just reread some of the old grooves rather than buying new ones. I just you know, it's the same joke over and over, so 
And of course, I do have Captain Armadillo to read. Woohoo! <laughs> Unless somebody buys it out under me. I, I don't think you have to worry about that. I don't know. That title was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there were times when I would buy stuff just for the title or just for the cover. I mean, I can't do it now because a lot of times, you know, at four or five bucks a comic, it gets a little sharp. But, you know, back then, this was what, $2 a pop, mid 80s or mid 90s? Nope, late 80s. Ah, who cares? Corey, what are you geeking on? What's got you happy as a clam? Uh, well, because I'm doing all these sleeping overnights, and they don't want me to work as much on weekends, I actually have more spare time on weekends. So this weekend, I actually spent it working on behind-the-scenes stuff on the podcast, cleaning some stuff up, uh, polling people on the name of our new podcast, Joe. Ooh. And, and we have a winner. We do. We have a winner. Aww. Oh, the new podcast is going to be called Solitaire Rose Series and Review. Boring. Yeah, but that's what the people want. I like Crazy Comics Cavalcade because you could buy our, you know, uniforms from the Ku Klux Klan. Oh Lord! But uh, it's going to be a new series where we go over old comic series or mini series or or things like that. The first one Joe and I are going to do is we're going to go over Master of Kung Fu. But I've got some other ones. We're go I'm going to be sitting down with Matt Brundage to go over his series, Art Ops. And then we're going to sit down with uh, the folks from Ghoul Scouts, and we're going to do what I like to call DVD commentary on all four issues of that. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun. There will be some that Joe won't be a part of. There will be some that I will do alone. My EC uh, comic stuff that I was doing on Solitaire Rose is actually going to move over to that. Moving on over. Drag it on over. Because uh, Solitaire Rose Radio is kind of morphing into more of an interview show, although I do want to get back to doing non-interview stuff. But I think this series and review is going to be a cool way to kind of get back on track with the EC stuff and uh, something that I don't see a lot of people doing. I don't see a lot of people saying, all right, we're going to go through the first ten issues of Master of Kung Fu and talk about them and, and, and review them. Uh, the other thing that I did over the weekend, uh, while I was taking care of stuff, I watched about, uh, I, I did a binge watch show. I haven't done a binge watch. I'm not one of those people who has time for a binge watch. But I watched uh, about uh, eight episodes of Archer in a row. But how many pieces of pie did you eat? Because I've seen you binge pie. I only had one a day. Oh, that's terrible. Because I, I don't want to become, you know, I don't want to gain all my weight back that I've Corey's lost. Corey's the pie master. <laughs> and I got uh, I'm never going to say I got caught up because I'm almost a year behind on Ring of Honor but I watch a lot of Ring of Honor and I watch a lot of New Japan so I got through a lot of the stuff on the TiVo well I got through some stuff on the okay I, I made a dent in the TiVo but I also sat down and read a bunch of comics including Grant Morrison's two issues of Heavy Metal Heavy Metal is a magazine that I have never really been a huge fan of. Um, when I first heard about it was like, well, when the movie came out, I heard about the magazine. And I picked it up, and it wasn't, you know, not my cup of tea. It wasn't bad, it's good stuff, but it's not the kind of comics that I was interested in. Um, I thought Epic did a better job because Epic uh, was more American stuff and it was more linear, whereas Heavy Metal was more European, and the European storytelling didn't appeal to me then. But Grant Morrison took over as editor-in-chief of Heavy Metal with that issue 281, so I read 281 and 282, and I really like it. It's a really good anthology series with some amazing art, and Morrison does a story in each issue. So, I'm looking forward to what he's doing. It comes out every other month, and uh, I'm amazed that Heavy Metal is still in print. I have no idea how many it sells, but I'm excited to see what Grant Morrison's going to be pulling in because he, you know, he comes from he comes from British comics, but he knows a lot about world publishing. So I'm looking for him to bring in more. More story-based stuff with um, with really good art. So I, I really enjoyed that. And then um, 
on the Marvel Comics app, I just decided I was going to sit down and read uh, the original graphic novels. Because if you go out to the Marvel Unlimited app, you know those uh, original graphic novels they've been putting out, like X-Men No More Humans and the, the Spider-Man one by Mark Wade. They're all out there now. So you can read them as part of the Marvel Unlimited. You don't have to pay 25 bucks a pop. Nope, they're just right there. And again, the Avengers one by Warren Ellis is amazing. It's so good. You know what else you don't have to pay for? Um, what? In memory of C. Martin Coker passing away, AdultSwim.com has put every available episode of Space Coast Coast to Coast on AdultSwim.com with no login required. Hopefully it's still running by the time this podcast drops, but if you get a chance, head on over. Yep, that'll be a good way to waste about three, four hours and laugh yourself sick. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, comic-wise, I, I looked at to see what's coming up in, in, in my box. Joe, next month is the month before NaNoWriMo, but I'm going to be reading all month because... Alan Moore's novel, Jerusalem, will be in my box. Ooh. And um, the people who are reading it online are all saying that it's incredibly good. I know with uh, Voices of the Fire that people got a little confused with the storytelling style and it didn't quite mesh for everybody. But this one is getting rave reviews from uh, Entertainment Weekly and then the people I follow on Facebook who are comic creators who've worked with them. Because they've all they all got their copies early, but I imagine over the next month or so, as more and more people get their copies, there'll be more reviews. And I'm really looking forward to reading it, even though you know it, it, it's going to be bigger than a damn omnibus. And um, that's really about it. Believe it or not, kids, you've listened to us blather on about funny books for an hour and a half. Did we say anything? I don't know. People will. People could be the judge of that. I That's don't remember. True. But now it's part of the ages. Or yes. at least webs. It's out there forever. And we'll be judged for it. Probably harshly. <laughs> and as we say every week, the comic we like the least, we still like better than the comic that you uh, like the most. Joe? You know, I feel like dancing. Call my mama. Hit my music. <laughs>